in between sixth to seventh grade where I would randomly search up on YouTube um, sex scenes in movies or mm. kissing scenes in movies. And so there was just this thing in me that wanted to explore this, this form of affection, this form of intimacy. And so even though I didn't really have a close, in-depth relationship with God like that, I knew what I was doing was wrong because I was willing to hide it. The, and it was it was a very, very bright light, the brightest light I've ever seen in my life. There was no wall, there was no ceiling, and there was no floor. I was floating. And I heard the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ come to me. I didn't see him, but I heard him. It sounded like he was yelling, but whispering at the same time. His voice sounded like thunder. to our podcast. Today we have a truly inspiring guest with us, Jesse Williams. Jesse's journey is a testament to the power of faith and redemption. Growing up in a Christian home with his father serving as a pastor, Jesse seemed to have it all. A loving family, financial stability, a sense of security. However, despite the out outward as appearance of a perfect life, Jesse found himself grappling with feelings of emptiness and lo loneliness. Despite the love and the support of his family, he struggled with the allure of sin, falling into patterns of fornication and immorality that left him feeling lost and alone. Yet in the midst of his darkest moment, Jesse experienced a divine encounter, a moment where he heard the unmistakable voice of God speaking directly to him. It was in this moment of clarity that Jesse made a life-altering decision to surrender his life to Christ, setting him on a path of redemption and spiritual renewal. Join us as, we, uh, as Jesse shares his powerful testimony and the profound transformation that comes from placing our trust in God. Jesse, I want to welcome you to the podcast and thank you for being here. How yes. you feel? How are you doing? I feel amazing. I first want to say thank you, Cindy, for having me on. It is a complete honor and blessing. And I am super, super excited to testify. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And so I have never been nervous or passive about sharing my testimony because God has just been so faithful to me and he just continues to be faithful. Amen. Amen. That That's wonderful. Um, you know, we, we're thrilled to have you here. Um, you know, you have a powerful, powerful testimony. Um, as, as you said, you know, you had this perfect life, um, you know, loving parents, you lived in a nice neighborhood, nice home, had financial stability. You never missed a meal. You know, your parents never struggled. Um, you could literally have whatever you wanted. Um, however, you know, you fell into a lifestyle um, that wasn't pleasing to God, you know. And so I just want you to take us through that journey, um, you know, talk about your family, your, your Christian walk. And something happened in the fifth grade, right? Something happened in the fifth grade. Um, and so just take us through that journey. I'm just going to open up the floor. You know, enough about me. I'm not I'm no longer going to be talking. So the floor is yours. Um, just begin sharing where you want to start, Jesse. Yes, ma'am. Um, so that biography that you read was so accurate. So I will start with just everything you've already said. Just I grew up in a very loving home. My father and mother were both present and they weren't just present, but they were loving. They were kind. I never, ever didn't hear from them how much I was worth. They were people that wasn't, they were intentional to speak value over me. They would always tell me that I have a purpose, that I 
am going to be someone special to the world and to this generation. And so I never grew up doubting how they felt about me. And I grew up in church. My father, as you said, was a pastor, um, has been a pastor. He's still a pastor. So he's been a pastor ever since I was born to now. And so I grew up going to church. I grew up singing all the songs, reading scripture. I was in the choir as a young kid. I was even an usher. So I grew up in church. I know church like the back of my hand and I just grew up in church. And so that was always my experience. And I would say, especially to the point of what you said happened in fifth grade, I went to you know school just like any other normal kid and every child wants to fit in. Every child wants to feel like they belong with the crowd. And so a lot of my testimony does have to do with sexual immorality and fornication and a pornography addiction, but it was other things that manifested in my life that took place before that. So uh, Cindy, you mentioned about the fifth grade. So what she's referring to is in the fifth grade, that was when I started cursing. That was when I started using profanity. And I, I remember the switch because in fourth grade, I don't even, I don't even remember hearing profanity in the classroom. But when fifth grade came, I just remember hearing just a lot of prof profane language. And so then I started to curse myself. Then I even started to listen to music with sexual references, with foul language and all that stuff. And so I was just feeding my spirit those things as a young kid. And so before I ever even masturbated or had sex with anybody, that seed was planted in my heart. And so that was something that I would consistently practice. And so that's just what I did. And so from then on, I think until about fifth to sixth grade, um, I was just being a normal kid, having fun with my friends, playing video games and whatnot. And so I remember the enemy is very intentional with what he allows people to see, especially young children. And this is why even now I'm even convicted about the movies that I watch, the entertainment that I watch, um, because it started with that. And so I would obviously watch certain movies and there would be um, sexual scenes where they wouldn't show the actual body parts. Mm -hmm. But because I had never seen sexual intimacy before, there was a level of curiosity in my mind. So I believe it was around in between sixth to seventh grade where I would randomly search up on YouTube um, sex scenes in movies or mm. kissing scenes in movies. And so there was just this thing in me that wanted to explore this, this form of affection, this form of intimacy. And so mm. I had no idea what I was doing or what I was inviting in. And so I would just continue to look at these things and watch them and nothing pornographic came up yet until there was one day where I began to watch a scene of, it was actually two women actually, and they were kissing on each other. And um, it, was, it was very, very seductive. And at the end of the video, it actually led me to the website, to the pornographic website. And it said, visit, you know, whatever, whatever website to see more. So that's when I, of course, as a curious child, decided to click the website. And so I immediately in that moment, and mind you, I was never molested. I was never touched. I was never taken advantage of. But I can say that my innocence was stripped from me by a form of deception uh, mm -hmm. from the enemy. I didn't even realize it. But I ended up going to this website and I began to see pornographic videos. And so I clicked on a video and I saw this man and this woman engaging in sexual activity. And so I did not know what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, I had no, I had no idea. My body wasn't even responding to the video because I was still naive. I was still kind of innocent in a sense because my mindset was, like what is happening? And this yeah. speaks about the perversion of this generation, of this world oh. that is trying to expose children to Wait. sexual conduct at an early age. And oh. so I just wanna pause and just let you know that 
this is not normal. That's right. These these kinds of things should not be normal in in our um, society. As children or as a child, my mind could not even grasp that kind of thing. And so it was ultimately nothing but perversion that I was exposed to it at a young age. So I ended up finished watching the video and I kind of just turned the laptop off, cleared the history and did all that stuff. And so then I kept going back to the site. So I kept watching it again and I kept Googling and I was not pleasing myself or masturbating or any of that. I was just watching out of curiosity because I was just so captivated. I didn't know what was happening. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until um, there was one time that I was in my basement alone and I was, my body was beginning to respond. I was going through puberty. And so I began to touch myself. And so I didn't know anything about self-pleasure or what that was like. But I learned from watching videos. So in the videos, I would see the men please themselves to the woman that they were um, having sexual contact with. And so I essentially did that. And so then that was my first time experiencing uh, an orgasm or release, if you will. And so then in that moment, I realized Oh, and it felt like I crossed a different threshold. It felt like I crossed the threshold of perversion. And so I remember in that moment when I first um, experienced that, I knew something shifted in my life. Something changed and my mentality changed. So then now pornography and masturbation took over my life. It was to the point to where I could, I I would do it every single day. Mm. I would... I will, and I'm being transparent because this, I want to be as transparent as possible because I want to let you all know how deep I was in sexual addiction. I would listen to moaning sounds on YouTube when I was on road trips with my parents and I couldn't masturbate or watch porn. I would do whatever I could to soothe my promiscuity. And that's, that's how deep and strong my sexual addiction was. And something was just awakened in me. Um, and so I remember that I would do this every single day as much as I could, as much as I felt the urge to. Every time I felt the urge, I masturbated, which is why pornography is so harmful to marriages, to men, to women. And it, it goes against the nature of a believer because the fruit of the spirit is self-control. So now I didn't know what life was like with discipline. I didn't know what life was like without um, n without having to demonstrate self-control. And so while this was manifesting in regards to sexual immorality, this stuff was affecting my entire life. This was affecting my entire being. It was affecting my mind also to the point to where I would hide it. And so even though I didn't really have a close in-depth relationship with God like that, I knew what I was doing was wrong because I was willing to hide it. And mm -hmm. so- you know, right. children are smart. I don't care what they say. Whenever a person is trying to hide something um, or if they're trying to act as if they're not doing it, but they are and it's a form of deception deep down inside. It's because they truly know that what they're doing is immoral or unethical in some way, shape or form. And so that was my that was me. I was hiding it. And it wasn't until a very, very I will never forget this day. A very, very interesting day in my high school career took place. I would I would watch porn and masturbate before I would go to school every single day. That was just something that I just did. And so um, in regards to that, I remember one time I was on a specific website and my phone caught a virus. Mm. So now I'm stuck because I tried to take the battery out of my phone. I tried to turn my phone back off and things of that nature. And so the phone was not turning off. The screen was not switching. It wasn't changing. Even when I took the battery out and put it back in, it wasn't changing. So then I was stuck because I had to tell my parents because I couldn't receive calls. I couldn't text. So if something happened to me and my mom called me, I couldn't get back to her. You see how this thing affects your life? your normalcy of life 
this is beyond just sexual sin. And I don't know why I'm going here, but I just feel the need to say this. This stuff affects, it's like a spider web. It connects to different areas of your life and will affect how you maneuver. And it's not just with sexual sin, it's sin in general, right? So I ended up going and telling my mother and my father. Now, this was very nerve wracking for me because I've never told them this. They didn't know, they had no idea that I was doing this. And so I remember I told them and I remember I remember the clear as day I went to their bedroom and I said, mom and dad, and I, I confessed to them right then and there. And I remember when I told them the first thing my father said to me was, we do not look at you as an animal. You are not disgusting to us. And that was the first time. And I didn't know it in that moment, but I didn't realize that I was receiving my heavenly father's affirmation through my natural father. And so mm -hmm. that was my first encounter with father God's affirmation, the understanding and the revelation that my temptation does not take on my identity. And that when I am in Christ, even if I do sin, sin is not my identity. So that was my first time ever seeing that. And I, 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 I was appreciative to the fact that my father and my mother showed me grace that they did not um, judge me according to the dirt that I placed before them. And yeah. I felt safe. I felt convicted, but I felt safe. And I think sometimes what we as the church can lack, and I say this as well as a minister in a church, is I think we we don't struggle in demonstrating conviction, but sometimes we struggle in demonstrating safety for that person that is struggling, that is battling their flesh. And so mm -hmm. it was to the point to where my mother and I had to go to the AT&T store to get my phone fixed. So mm -hmm. I remember dealing with the shame and the condemnation of what I had done because we had to go into the store. So that means they were going to see the screen. They everything. were going to see the virus. They were going to see everything and it was going to expose me. Mm -hmm. And so I remember I told my mom, I said, mom, I don't want to go in the store with you. And she said, okay, you just stay in the car. And my mother went into the store and was willing to get looked at as if, why is this lady watching porn? When in her right. mind, she knows this is not me. This is my son doing this, but mm -hmm. I'm going to go and I'm going to take on the shame of what yeah. he has done publicly. And I'm going to yeah. cover him. Sounds like Jesus to me. Right. And, right. and so that that blessed me when at, when every time I think about that, it was this, it was as if my mom wasn't even phased. She didn't care what anybody thought about her. She yeah. just said, we're just going to figure this out and we're going to fix this. And so even after that situation, I still didn't even learn my lesson. I went back into it again. But mm -hmm. this time it got worse because now that was in high school. So in high school, I was starting to get made fun of and bullied because while I was watching porn and masturbating, I had not had sex. I was a virgin, right? So now there was this urge in me to have sexual intercourse with a woman because that's what I felt like made me cool. That's what I felt was the thing to do. Yeah. And so I remember even while I was masturbating and watching pornography, there was still this void in my heart that felt that made me feel as if I was not good enough because I hadn't had sex. And so identity and understanding who you are is just so very, very important. And the thing is, my mother and my father would consistently tell me who I was, but it's one thing to hear it with your mind. It's another thing to engage it with your heart. Yeah. And so it, I'm reminded of the scripture where it says, Jesus said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And these are people that they had the mental revelation of who Jesus was, but they didn't have a heart revelation of who he was. Oh and God. so that was something that I was struggling with. I did not have a heart revelation of who I was and that this was beneath me and that God had called me to live a better lifestyle than this.
I ended up going to this camp and I met this girl there and we ended up having sex. And so that was the, um, that was the place where I lost my virginity. And th 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 there's a very interesting testimony behind that actually. Um, and I'm going to get into that later on because let me tell y'all, God, God, let me just say God redeems all things. Um, and so me and this girl had sex and then we got into a relationship for a little bit. And then afterwards we ended up breaking up. But after we broke up, I was having multiple sexual excursions with women. And that was just something that I was just doing consistently all the way until I get to college and my college, I went to North Carolina a t State University. I went to a HBCU. We have a homecoming known as GHO, which stands for Greatest Homecoming on Earth. So our homecoming is wild. There's a lot of wickedness, perversion, idolatry that manifests in our homecoming. And so I'm just being honest. This is not throwing a shot at my school. I love my school, but I, I call wickedness wickedness. The Bible says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. And so there's much wickedness that takes place um, in this homecoming. And so I, I, would, um, I, would, I would see certain things and I was in a in-between kind of period where about two weeks before the homecoming, I met a mentor of mine, a young man who discipled me for a short season in my college career. Um, and I was still kind of just in between. And I remember on the tail end of me going into the homecoming week, I was having, I, I was having sexual excursions with a girl. And mm -hmm. right before the homecoming, I cut it off and I stopped. And so I remember there was this other girl that I had actually planned to um, have excursions with before the school year started, but we never did anything. And so now I guess both of us were available. And so we texted each other and we were actually planning to have sex the last day or the second to last day of homecoming. So homecoming, I, I didn't really do anything. I kind of just stayed to myself in my room. And I felt like that was the Lord protecting me and covering me in all honesty, because I don't know what I could have gotten myself into. So I go to this girl's dormitory, which was actually right next to my dormitory. So all I had to do was just get up and walk, you know, maybe like 30 seconds to a minute. And mm -hmm. I'm in her room and her and I are laying in the bed together. This is a ridiculous story. I still don't believe how this happened. Mm -hmm. I'm in the bed with her and my body is not responding sexually. Now, I thought something was wrong with me because this has never happened to me before. Um, I have never, ever been in a situation like that before, ever in my life. So the context of my mind is like, oh, my goodness, what is happening? Like, why is this taking place? And so I'm in the bed with her and I can't I don't have peace. Like my soul is very unsettled right now. And so I turned to the wall and I heard the voice of the Lord for the first time in my life. Thanks, and he said, get up and leave. Mm. And I, I turned away from the girl and began to look at the wall and I'm looking at the wall and as if like God is the wall and I'm, I'm looking at the wall and I'm looking at God and I'm trying to go back and forth with God in my soul like, oh my gosh, what, what's happening? And mm -hmm. so I couldn't take it anymore because there was so much toiling that my soul was going through. See, sometimes you got to learn to let things go for the sake of the peace of your soul. Sin makes your soul toil. And I think a lot of times in the body of Christ, we have a lot of toiling in our spirits and in our souls, not because we're going through a season of affliction, but because we're fighting and tugging with God to just obey him. But with obedience comes peace. Amen. So, so I left the room. I told the girl, I said, I can't do this. I left the room. I told you all that I had a mentor who was discipling me at the time. The day, this was actually a Sunday. So this is the last day of homecoming. The oh. day, so when I left the girl's dorm room, as I'm walking from her dorm to my dorm, I get a call. 
And I get a call from my roommate who met with my mentor at the time. And my roommate calls me and says, hey, bro, your mentor, the guy, he says the guy's name. He says, hey, such and such has free Kirk Franklin tickets for you. Do you want to come? So mind you, this is what happened. Mm. I left a moment of temptation and sin and wickedness. And I received free access to wow. a gospel concert to go see Kirk Franklin. On the call, the guy said, look, he said he'll take you. You won't even have to get gas or anything. You don't even have to pay. It's a free ticket. So all you got to do is just get, get dressed and come. And he said, if that's what you want to do, then he said he's offering that to you. So I texted him and he said, yeah, go ahead. And so I remember I went into my dorm room, Cindy. Mm -hmm. I remember I called my mom and I told her everything that happened. I said, mom, mm -hmm. I was getting ready to have sex with a girl and I left and I just got a free Kirk Franklin ticket. And I feel like God is speaking to me, mom. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't know what this is. And so she just, my one thing, one thing that I appreciate about my parents is they always lived righteously before me, but they always took the stand. They raised me in the fear of the Lord, but they always took the stance of you're going to have to know Jesus for yourself. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that because that's why my relationship with God is so strong because I chose to go to God. They didn't force me to him. So, so my mom mm -hmm. said, yeah, like something along the lines of the Lord is speaking to you and, you know, just continue to walk with him. That was all mm -hmm. she said. And I think after we hung up the phone, I remember exactly where I was, room 117, Curtis Hall. And I remember I looked down and I said, okay, wow. And I remember the Lord spoke to me again and he said, Jesse, if you follow me, I will take you places that you never thought you could go. I will open up doors before you that you never thought could be open. And what God was doing is he was using this Kirk Franklin ticket as a prophetic sign that if I continue to obey him, all I would have to do is just walk through things. Things would be set up before me. Things would manifest for me. I wouldn't even have to do anything except simply obey. And that's what God has done. And so from that moment, I gave my life to Christ and I've been following the Lord Jesus ever since. After that, a couple of days later, Yes, Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost. Mm. A, couple, a couple days later, I'm mm. trying so hard not to speak in tongues. <laughs> a couple mm. days, a couple, Wait. a couple days later, I'm sitting in the cafeteria. It was like 1 p.m. Mm. And I remember I was eating a burger. The Lord said to me again, his voice started speaking to me. He started speaking to me more clearly. He said, Jesse, I want you to get tested. I said, What? Now, when God told me that, I got scared because my mindset was, why else would God tell me that other than the fact that I have a STD? No. So I was thinking I had an STD. So mm -hmm. I went to the health center, I think the next day. And I remember, Cindy, I was so grieved no. in my soul. I was probably in there for about 30 to 40 minutes, but it felt like I was in there for four hours. Yeah. Because while I was in there, it was as if I was replaying every excursion, everything I did with a woman, every way that I've sinned against God with my body. And I could just feel the weight of my sin. And so mm -hmm. I remember I was getting my blood taken by this nurse. And so she took my blood and my arm was shaking. And she said, boy, why is your arm shaking? What's, what's wrong? And I said, I will be honest, like I have a sexual past mm -hmm. and I'm getting tested because I'm afraid that I have STDs and um, I don't want to have anything and I'm nervous. I just don't want to have anything. You know, I want to change my life and I want to move different. This woman looked at me and she said, you don't have anything. You're fine. Wow. And I looked at her and I said, lady. What are you talking about? How do you even know that? You the was the test results didn't come. So, mind you, I didn't know about the prophetic. I didn't know that the Holy Spirit can speak to somebody supernaturally about another person's situation. I didn't know that. So when this lady told me 
that I had nothing wrong with me. I didn't know that it was actually the Lord Jesus speaking to her directly. So then they told me that I would get my test results in about two weeks. Guess when I got my test results back? Three days later. So three days later, I got my test results back and I look syphilis negative, gonorrhea Mm. negative, HIV negative, all of it negative. And I remember exactly where I was. I was actually standing in between my dorm room and the girl's dorm room that I was about to sleep with. And that's where I was standing when I was reading my results. I remember this. I was a freshman at a in 2018. And I heard the scripture that I would hear all the time growing up. Romans 8, there is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And this is not to shame anybody that does have an STD. And I believe the Lord can actually heal you from that because I believe in miracles. But this is just my story. And this is what God did for me. And I'm grateful for that. And this was his way of showing me that my sins were not held against me after I repented and gave my life to him. So that was around November, December-ish. We fast forward to 2019, the beginning of 2019. Your boy got in a romantic relationship. Now, I just want to pause and I want to say, (laughs) I want to give a special shout out to my apostle, Apostle Jordan Bryce, who is my spiritual father, um, because I believe a lot of reasons why this next part of my testimony happens is because of a lack of discipleship. If you enjoy our content, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to stay up to date with our latest releases. Turn on the notification bell. Have a story to tell? We'd love to hear it. Reach out to us at cindybingham.com or connect with us on Instagram. Now, back to the show. And and it's very important that people are told, no, you're not ready for something. No. If you take this step, this will be detrimental to your destiny and your relationship with God. No, you shouldn't date. You're not ready to date right now, right? So I ended up getting a relationship with this girl. And for a season, we didn't do anything sexual. But then we did because we were a little loose and the flesh got out of hand. So what happened? Started having sexual excursions again. Started watching porn again. So now I'm in this cycle of this again. But now on the other side, I'm crying out to God, mad at myself, angry at myself, really, really frustrated with myself because I'm like, God, this is my fault. This is why I this is I I deserve every bit of this because I'm the one that chose to do this. When I was when I formed a relationship with this girl, I didn't even pray. I told God what I was going to do, and I wanted him to come into alignment with it. But that's not Mm -hmm. how the Lord works. He is on his own side. And so my consequences dug me a hole of a sin cycle that the Lord pulled me out of. And so I was that dog that returned back to its vomit. I was. That's what happened. And I remember that lasted for about until i think it was 2020 or 2021 yeah it lasted until 2021 and i remember on new year's i broke up with the girl and i ended the relationship and from then on i decided to say okay god like i'm not gonna go forth in anything until you lead me and even in that like i still had a slip up you know, and I'm just being honest and I'm just being transparent because we can't lie to folk. OK, we have to be honest and transparent. And so I remember like there was another time. And I think especially I just want to speak to the men and just you really need to deal with the insecurities of your soul, because if you don't, then women that you are attracted to, when they start giving you attention and affection, you'll start leaning into them. But we as men. It's very important to allow the presence of God to fill our voids, lest we use women to fill that place. So so the Lord had to, and he did, he delivered me from pornography, masturbation, sexual morality again. So he did it again. And I'm grateful that he broke that off of me because honestly, 
because of that situation, I didn't think that he would. I, my faith was very, very low. And mm. I thought that I was going to live with this cycle for the rest of my life. But I sit in this chair before you today mm. as a delivered vessel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I just want to take this moment to just encourage anybody that even if you've gotten yourself in the pit, God is so merciful and kind that he will pull you out. Yes, he will. And there is yet still hope for you. So my, my spiritual journey skyrocketed. Um, and in the middle of that relationship with that person that I told you all about, the Lord was still kind and it was still a level of closeness that I was drawing to him because I was still praying and seeking his face and reading his word. And so I remember one day before the pandemic, I went to a camp, uh, a Baptist youth camp in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And I remember I was in the audience of the auditorium and there was a call for people who dealt with um, family trauma. And they were going, they, they were just going through a lot. And so we, they did an altar call. And so I remember that they instructed everybody who was not receiving prayer to stretch out their hands and to pray for these people. So I began to pray. And when I began to pray, I began to speak in tongues uncontrollably right then and there. God baptized me with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I remember my, my, my stomach was burning. My stomach was burning and it was on fire. And this would happen to me um, many times, actually, when I freshly got saved, I would be in the, um, I would be in an event or in a, in a service. And whenever I felt the power of God, my lips would begin to quiver uncontrollably. I didn't know stammering tongues was in the Bible, but my lips would begin to quiver uncontrollably and I began to feel heat all throughout my body. And so that was something that me and God had. But then afterwards, I desired to speak in a heavenly language and I knew God would baptize me and I just believed him and trusted him. So at that camp, God baptized me with the Holy Ghost and I began to speak in tongues as I'm praying in intercession for these people. After that moment, I kind of shut down the gift and I didn't really um, utilize it as much. So then there came a moment after the pandemic, which I was getting ready to go into, where right before I had this encounter that I'm about to tell you about, mm. I would begin to pray in the spirit intentionally now. Paul mm. said, I will pray in the spirit and I will pray with understanding. That's so right. I mustered up the faith and God used one of my friends to just help walk me through this process. And so I mustered up the faith to begin to pray in the spirit and to trust God that while I couldn't logically understand what I was saying, the Holy Ghost could, God could, right? And so that I was praying in the language of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, he that prayeth in a tongue speaketh mysteries. So I knew that I was speaking mysteries into the, into the spirit realm, into the heavenlies. And so I just began to pray in the Holy Ghost. And so a couple of days into that time period of prayer, I had a very powerful encounter with the Lord. And so I was laying down in my bed and I went to sleep. And I remember when I went to sleep, I, I go to sleep and I'm in this encounter. Um, and when I go to sleep, I feel my body. I'm sorry. I feel my soul leave my body. I feel my spirit leave my body. And I go upward and I'm somewhere in a heavenly realm. Now, the reason why I know this is because I was floating the, and it was it was a very, very bright light, the brightest light I've ever seen in my life. There was no wall. There was no ceiling and there was no floor. I was floating and I heard the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ come to me. I didn't see him, but I heard him. It sounded like he was yelling, but whispering at the same time. His voice sounded like thunder, but but like a stream of rivers, it, it I couldn't describe it. Even though like, there's no words to describe what Jesus sounds like, but I knew it was the Lord Jesus. And he comes to me and like I said, I didn't see him, but I heard him. And he says to me, prophet. And he says that one word, he says that, that's all he says to me. And after he says that to me, I get sunk back down into my body. 
And by the time I was back in my body, it was morning. So I left. It was night. I came back. It was morning. This is how I knew I was in eternity because eternity is not confined to time. So an encounter that took probably about five to 10 seconds was essentially eight hours. A thousand years is like one day to God. So I, I said, okay, the Lord just told me that I was a prophet. Now, I didn't say anything to anybody. I didn't even voice it. I didn't even tell my parents when this happened. But I was just taken back. People started commenting on my post because I would post about Jesus on Instagram all the time. People would respond to me and say, God bless you, prophet. Thank you for this word, prophet. God was confirming this anointing that was on my life and, and people were recognizing it. It was because God had marked me from that day forward. And so even from that day forward, I was never the same. So when I chose to put down that relationship and God set me free from sexual immorality again, my prophetic call began to soar. Mm. And so the, the Lord unctioned my leader to even ordain me as a prophet. Now, check this, because this is the part of the testimony that I wanted to get to. So what many people don't know is the girl that I had sex with, the girl that I lost my virginity to, is actually from the city where my church is in now. Mm, mm. So, so I just want to speak to you about how God redeems all things. Mm. This is the place where I fell into sexual perversion. Mm. The same place where I entered sexual perversion is the same place where I was ordained as a prophet, where I preached my first message, where I met my spiritual father, where I first received deliverance. And the, 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 the second time where I got baptized in the Holy Ghost was in this region. So God ordained, God redeemed everything to the very location. He changed the representation of the region that I am now in. That's how kind he is. Another testimony. I just proposed to my fiance two days ago. So I am now engaged. Woo. God. Hallelujah. Shit. She's gorgeous. She is gorgeous. <laughs> I'm blessed y'all. And so I proposed to her in that city. Mm. So the city where I fell into sexual, y'all not hearing me. The city I that I entered into sexual perversion is the same city where I met my future wife and proposed to her. My God, my God, my God. God will redeem your storyline. If you just walk with him and you say no to the flesh and yes to the spirit, mm. God will open up so many doors for you that you wouldn't even expect. Last year, I got the opportunity to preach in, in Philadelphia. Um, that was my first time ever doing ministry outside of the home. And I have some other things coming up this year as well. But God has opened up doors for me that I can't even explain. Um, even with me being up here, God blessed me with a job sporadically. When I, when I graduated from college, I didn't even have a job offer. I had an interview. Mm -hmm. And I told the Lord, I knew that God had me to be in this region that I'm currently in. And so I told God, I said, God, if the job offers me, if a job offers offers me and it's not in the region that you have sent me, I'm not going because I want to go where there's grace. And so the Lord began to speak to me about how he was pleased about that. But I was waiting on him for a job to open up. A job opened up. They called me. I didn't even apply. They called me. And guess what? It's at their headquarters. My I work at a headquarters. <laughs> This is the plan that God had for me all along. God opened up this job to me before the interview even happened. I had a dream of me sitting face to face with my boss saying that I was hired. And within a matter of an hour after the last interview, I received a text from my boss saying that 
she was going to get an offer letter sent to me. Mm. So I'm not just speaking off of something that I do not know. I am a living witness of the favor and kindness and mercy and grace of God. And so I just want to encourage you that to whoever's watching this, yeah. I don't care how deep the pit is. I don't care how much you've messed up. If you repent, put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will change your entire life. He will accelerate your life. He will, he will redeem the storyline to down to the specific details that matter to your heart because he is so kind. And so I just want to release this testimony. And I pray that each of you were encouraged and blessed knowing that there is still hope for you and that the Lord can deliver you out of any pit. There is nothing too powerful for God. God is almighty. God is all powerful. I don't care what this world offers, mm. sex, drugs, weed, uh, horoscopes, new age, false gods. Jesus Christ is the only way. He is the only portal to freedom. And I'm telling you right now, as a witness of the Lord's deliverance, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, mm. you will experience freedom like no other. Jesse, prophet, man of God, you know what? There was fire coming out of your mouth, like literally mm. fire. I was just trying to keep my composure because powerful, powerful, powerful. What a powerful testimony. What a, I mean, you delivered it with all the power. Like I, like I said, fire was coming out of your mouth. Yeah. Tell us, how would you describe your personal relationship with Jesus? The scripture that comes to mind is the just shall live by faith. Mm. And when I say, and I know this is very cliche, but I mean, this is what the Bible says, you know, Jesus is my Lord. Mm. And, and I hold very tight to his commandments. Mm. Um, I, I, and I believe, you know, my leader has said this but I, I've always tried to carry a strong presence of the fear of the Lord. And, and while I love the Lord and he is a friend to me and I'm a friend to him, I fear him. Um, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter uh, five, I believe, Hebrews chapter four or five, the Bible says Jesus was heard because of his reverence. Mm. And so I, I, I am a witness of God answering my prayers coming through for me um, due to a form of reverence that I have for him. I take his instruction so seriously because he's never failed me. I trust him with all of my life. Mm. You know, as a young man, I'm 24 years old now. I'm engaged. I'm living on my own, paying bills, working a job. And the, the scripture that God is just reminding me of consistently day in and day out is just seek first the kingdom. And in this world, this world is very stressful. Life is hard. Things are becoming more and more expensive every day. But God is just reminding me that there's no fruit in worrying. Mm. There's no fruit in anxiety. Mm. And the psalm that I've been meditating on is when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Cindy, you asked, what is my relationship with Jesus? Jesus is my rock. Yeah. He is my foundation. He is my stability. Mm. I am nothing without him. I would not be here without him. Um, my faith in Christ is stabilizing my heart, my soul, my mind, and my body to this very day. He is, he is the very essence of my purpose and my existence. Jesus is my friend. Um, something I've been doing now um, recently um, in the past couple of years is I actually, I put down journaling for a season, but I've decided to pick it back up and I journal to the Lord and I talk to the Lord. Me and the Lord have this uh, special thing where when God begins to work on my heart, it feels like 
a rope is being untied and my heart is able to breathe. And so whenever God touches me with his presence and deals with my heart and heals my heart, it's like I can feel this loosening of my heart. And that's just something that God does. That's something that he and I have. But God is, is, is he is my best friend and he is my keeper and my father and my protector and my rock and my fortress. And that's, that's just who the Lord is to me. But I just say these things. I say these things to let people know that this is who he wants to be to you. He wants to be your shield and your buckler and he wants to be your safe place. So, um, that that's who the Lord is to me. And that's who he has continued to been, to have been. Wow. Thank you for sharing, Jesse. That was powerful. Amazing. Amazing. Um, what do you hope listeners take away from your testimony today? I hope listeners realize that God is not a respecter of persons. Mm. And so I don't want you all to think of me and Cindy, you know, even though while we are ministers and like in, we are leaders in our own right. Mm. I don't want you to think that we're here because there's something special about us. We are here because God put his hand on us and God will put his hand on anybody that comes to him. He, God will anoint anybody that comes to him. Mm -hmm. God will restore anybody and redeem anybody that comes to him. So if there's anything that I would say is do not feel that this is just for me, that this is just for Cindy, yeah. but full redemption is for everybody that puts their faith in Jesus. Full, the fullness of life, the Zoe of God is for anybody that puts their faith in Jesus. Hope, don't be hopeless. Mm. That is that is something that I really plead for you. Anybody who is listening to this, if you're dealing with hopelessness, hopelessness is not what the Lord wants you to experience. Jesus Christ is the hope of glory. You can have hope in Christ put your hope in Jesus. That's, that's my message. Man of God, let me just adjust myself here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You, that was powerful, powerful, powerful. Jesse, I do want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, I, I know, I know somebody will be watching and there'll be you know, they will connect with your story. You know, maybe they're going through uh, challenges related to, you know, fornication or sexual immorality. And, um, but I just want to thank you for just laying everything on the floor and, and the way you just delivered it. I know the Holy Spirit was behind it because it was so powerful and I felt it. So I really want to just thank you for, for doing that, you know. And um, all the best on your journey. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you for having me. Um, I love testifying about Jesus and what he's done in my life. As I said in the beginning, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And so I've been redeemed. And so I'm going to say so. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And I'm so excited, so excited about that news that you just gave us um, of your engagement. <laughs> Yes. You know, Hallelujah. Wow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is just doing amazing things, you know, and, and when you share the, um, the dream that you had, you know, I, I, I remember the, the life of Paul, like the, the revelation of Paul, Paul went to the third heaven, you know, and, and saw Christ, you know, and yes. so anyways, it's, you are a prophet, you are a prophet and you know, God himself qualified, he's the one who qualifies. So he qualified you to be a prophet. And I'm just so, so thankful to God for the things that he's doing in your life. And yes, family. so thank you. Yes. Thank you so much.